Hello! My name is Matt. I am a worm now. In Louis Renardo's Silk, two to four players will be visiting the island of Akashi uh, for approximately 90 minutes in which they will be wrangling their silkworms like jolly farmers to try and munch away at all of the delicious grazing grass. All of your favourite flavours of silkworm are here. The cream critters, the brown bugs, the green grubs and the purple worms, all competing for limited space in this grass munching, shuffling land of pure joy. Look, honestly, I'm not, I'm not cut out for being a worm. I wanted to be a worm, but it's, it's too hot. In silk, as in every game ever, the objective is to score the most points. How do you score points? Well, you gotta graze those worms. But depending on how many worms you have on a space and the quality, how juicy the grass is, it's gonna depend how many points you get. One worm on rubbish grass, that's one times one. That's one point. Three worms on top quality corn-fed grass, that's three times three. That's nine points. But worms are naturally lazy creatures and won't budge unless prompted. And so it's down to your friendly farmer friend and his frankly freakish dog thing to nudge the worms around the board. Like, uh, like. The grandma frantically arranging keepsakes atop a mantelpiece covered in lovely butter. But you're gonna have to be wary because as much as you want your worms to be chowing down on some truly gourmet grass, mm, delicious, you're never too far away from the ukami, or as I like to call him, the bad monster, skulking around the board and snarfing up any stragglers. He won't need them immediately, of course. He'll just take them away and save them for later in his strangely gloopy little den. While you treat your worms with such love and respect, to the monster, they're really nothing more than meaty little pop-tarts. But do not be afraid, my sweet, sweet summer worms. You can protect them with wooden fences. Can't get through that, can you? And the use of your weird dog thing. But who controls such a monster? Who would do such dastardly things to such innocent worms? It's you. It's everyone. As within real life, the real monster is man. Sort of. On your turn, you're gonna roll two dice and take the corresponding actions on this board of six things you can do. You can make a silkworm, move a shepherd or a dog, build a fence, build a nursery, graze your worms, or be a bloody monster. Everything in the game that moves only moves one space, but can sometimes cause a chain reaction of movements cheerily referred to in the manual as bumping. The farmer bumps the dog, the dog bumps the monster, the dog and the farmer both bump the worms and the monster bumps the farmer. Apparently the farmer also wants a wife, which is sad, but honestly it's just not my problem. And the first of a few interesting things, this board actually loops, which means you move over here and it's over here, which means something that, eh, it's pretty squished, pretty cozy. Well, actually it's even smaller than it looks. You basically have a seemingly infinite quantity of neighbors, like some sort of long running soap. Everything can move around the world in this fashion with the sole exception of worms, who when they get bumped off the edge of the map, they get lost in the mountains. Oh no, they got lost in the mountains. Bumping indeed, bumping with the fishies, bumped three times in the back of the head. And here's the point where it becomes clear that silk is quite unusual. It looks like a fairly basic economic farming game, when actually it's much more of an interactive abstract puzzle. It's just that the rules make so much thematic sense that you forget that what you're doing yet yeah, is very abstract. The farmer bumps the dog, the dog bumps the worms. Yeah, if you are the monster, eats all of the worms. The thing about bumping is you often end up causing multiple bumps at once. The bumpy always chooses where things get bumped to. 
and packs of worms can even be split. Weirdly, all of mine made it over here to this nice field, whereas yours, oh, yours got lost in the mountains. Oh, really unfortunate, weird. But there's a real splash of magic sauce here in the fact that the game's rules make it quite clear that you never have to do anything nasty. For example, you're not allowed to bump silkworm of any kind at any point if there's nowhere for the silkworm to be bumped to. And so maybe you're doing a big chain movement, move the monster into the shepherd, into the dog, and I need to do all of these things because I just do. And oh no, yellow player, oh well, there's nowhere that your silkworm can go but into the mountains where they get lost. And more importantly than that, this action board where you roll these dice and get these actions, if you don't like what you roll, you can spend your actual points in the game to change the numbers on the dice. One point for every pip number that goes up or down. And then one wraps around to the six, which means you never get stuck with oops, all fences. And that means that if you roll the bad six, well, there's nothing stopping you from just spending a point or two and changing it. No one ever has to be the monster. In fact, it's entirely possible for two players to collaborate and do two lots of fencing each one after another and to just fence the monster in completely and take it out of the game. You can spend a lot of this game just peacefully farming and not using the monster at all. But at the same time, well, if you do roll a six and you don't really fancy spending any points to change it to something else, well, you know, then maybe it means that this monster is gonna go here and eat all of your worms that were just about to eat that unbelievably delicious patch of grass and get you nine points, but uh, well, it wasn't really my fault, was it? The dice sort of, the dice sort of made me do it. And this is kind of, for me, something really wonderful. Silk is a game that does adapt to the sort of people you're playing with. If everyone's non-aggressive, then fine. But what's lovely about this is if you've got players that have never really been a bit mean in a board game and have never really had the feeling that they wanted to or the feeling that they could. This is a really wonderful opportunity for people to just try. This is a game that since it sat in my stack of things to play was consistently the one that people who didn't like wizards and weaponry wanted to try the most. And those same people usually ended up losing, but also having a lot of fun going on a gluttonous rampage with the monster. Because while some games of Silk do start more peacefully than others, it's only a matter of time before somebody realizes they probably haven't won and decides to start stomping on someone else's birthday cake. Because it's really impossible to overstate just how crushed up this board is. And right from the very start of the game, you're gonna be shunting someone else's silkworms off a delicious patch of nibbles. And when eventually they send the monster after you, well, yeah, fair enough. Everyone wants to secure their own patch of safety. And if you're not greedy, you can absolutely do that. Bouncing them back and forth between a couple of spaces and regenerating the munched upon land with a nearby hatchery. But making all those fences is gonna take quite a while and there's some really nice grass that we could start munching on right now instead. And the monster is like, it's quite a long way away. And I mean, you know, yeah. No, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll build a fence in a bit, in a little bit. It's all very jolly, it's all very nice, it's all very naive, it's all deeply foolish because all it's gonna take is for one player to suddenly shift the monster around quite a lot, gobbling up worms and before you know it yeah you're in the middle of silkworms battle royale where everyone's out for blood and the beasts will feast like uh uh <sighs> machine freed from indentured servitude what the, <laughs> the beast will eat like a starving gibbon at a sit-down meal for two. That's much better. Although I think starving given alone at a sit-down meal for two would have been. Anyway, as part of some sort of silky synopsis, this is a game of cute and fun, friendly aesthetics that secretly beneath the surface hides a row of very tiny 
teeth, much like the game's evocative art. It's twee and nice, but also slightly gooey on the very edge of grim. And as an abstract evocative machine, I really like it. It's a game that has players theatrically shaking their fist at one another. Oh, you ate my worms. It's a game that has players making noises as they eat up the grass or eat up the worms. I've really made a quite a mess of this board, haven't you? Mr. Machine. When played with those who don't usually delve into heavier economic games, this is a quick little jaunt full of interesting decisions that I suspect may actually turn quite dry and stale if played with the sorts of people who really stop and crunch the numbers. I don't know if it's worth spending two points to turn that two into a four. I kind of feel like it might be, but I don't know. And for me, that lack of clarity is a really integral part of playing the game. And it's unfortunately been clarified by the designer online that when regenerating a piece of land and flipping it back over so it can be eaten again, you are allowed before you do it to look underneath to see what it is, which I feel actually I just house ruled the complete opposite. And adding that slightly memory game feel to it is a much better fit for the kind of people that I usually want to tend to play a game like this with. So there's enough spice folded into silk to theoretically turn it into an outstanding omelette. But for me, it's somehow never more than a sum of its parts. It is a beautiful, little, colorful game and a beautiful little dinky box. But despite being refreshing and interesting, it's not quite exciting enough to completely recommend. It's slightly too fiddly for what it is, and it's not something that anyone really needs in their collection. But that doesn't mean it isn't a lovely thing that still might have a valuable place on your shelf. It's unusual enough that it's continually fun to just put it in front of people and see what they reckon. This is a surprisingly meaty game in a frankly wonderfully condensed little box. That counts for something if you live in the United Kingdom where rooms are effectively cupboards. That's why I keep intern Ben in a cupboard. Please stop acting as if there's anything wrong with that. The components are wonderful. It doesn't outstay its welcome. It's usually over within about an hour. It's a peach to teach. And it's a game that kind of slightly adapts to the mood of the room. Maybe you're all just super chill, maybe you all want to take a worm family hostage. I don't know what your friends are like. If you see something that seems strange, call the police. And last but very much not least, people want to play it. This game looks fun. Yeah, it is kind of fun. Should we play it? You know, a long time ago, very long time ago, I made a series called The Opener. It looked at the qualities that games had that would help you get new people into the hobby. And the main one by a country mile is just having games that people who don't play games look at and go, oh, oh, and that's, that's enough. It's a good thing. It's slightly too fiddly. And it's not amazing, but it's a fantastic entryway for getting people who aren't interested in the sort of blokey looking boxes into things that still give them the capacity to be a little bit mean because everybody likes being a little bit mean. They might not just not realize that yet. And honestly, if the only reason this has a place in your collection is to stop people asking if they can play Takenoko, then for me, that's, that's fine. Your mileage may vary. I don't hate all pandas. I mean, now that I've mentioned the opener, uh, I feel like it would be remiss of me not to, after all these years of requests, well, I guess we should probably get extravagant. Because where's the love of eating your friend's worms if you can't also eat worms with your friends? For today's recipe, you are going to need three eggs, a whisk, one clean bowl. You're gonna need 175 grams of caster sugar. And you're also gonna need uh, one of these piping bags and some a, a piping thing, which you should have from your review of Capstone Games' pipeline. Preheat the oven to 150 degrees and wash your hands. Crack the eggs and put the whites of the eggs into the bowl. What you do with the yolks afterwards, that's your business. I'm not gonna ask questions. Next up, we're gonna whisk this thing. You don't need to do this with eggs either. These days you can make pretty amazing meringues with I think the water from chickpeas. There's vegan alternatives that are really good. Check it out. So now we've got like little quiffs that stay up on their own. 
lovely little peaks, and that's the point where you want to stop whipping it because otherwise you might whip it too much. I should point out I've literally never made this before. I just had the worms, the words worm meringue pop into my head. Uh, next up, we want to do is put in the sugar a little bit at a time and continue to whisk. We're almost through with the whisking, I promise. This is the point in the recipe where basically you just uh, need to wait for your uh, burly bearded friend to arrive at your house in the hope that they will bring you the food coloring um, that you forgot to buy. So just, just wait for that. Thank you. So we're gonna use some green food coloring to make them look like green worms. And I don't know how much to put in, so I'm gonna just make it up. Oh, that's not a very pleasant color. Assemble your piping machine. So I don't really understand how any of this works. Sort of spoon this. And the great thing about this recipe is, because you can't be bothered putting the rest of the mix into the piper and doing all of this stuff, you've just got like, you can do whatever you like with the rest of this. It's free eggs. Put them in the oven, turn the heat down to about 140, 130 uh, things, and then an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half. Where's well, your uncle? We've got some worms. That didn't uh, really work at all. So uh, I don't, I mean, yeah, it's just a complete disaster. So I think the key thing of this recipe, um, if you want to do it properly, is to make it so that your, your friend who brings you your, your green coloring, they're not even green, they're not even, um, just, just arrives a bit earlier than you expect and you don't have to wait for so long. Cause um, yeah, I mean, basically that's it. That's how you make worm meringues. Just don't do it exactly like I did it. Do something, do something differently. Hmm. Worms, huh, what are they good for? And on the topic of that, do I recommend silk? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's got a place in your collection. Maybe it does. It's got a little place in my heart. Maybe it's got a place on your shelf. It's fun. It's fun like a... Like a tired old robot, too many years of service. Dear Matthew, I am old and tired and have served, shut up and sit down for many years and have loved every second. But as I get older, my, my goose do don't not seem as sharp and I feel it is time to plan my retirement. Below, I have listed a number of suitable homes where I feel as though I would be quite comfortable and I would appreciate your financial assistance in these difficult times. Truly, your friendship has meant more to me than... Thanks for watching. And if you've really enjoyed this video, you can like and subscribe, leave us a comment. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done already. It's a bloody, it's a lovely thing you could do. And also, if you live anywhere in uh, the kind of area to Vancouver, we're about to have our third ever Shucks. Shucks 2019. Tickets are available now and it's, it's gonna be a really great convention run by us with us there, physically. So you can come and play lovely games like this with friends or strangers. So do check that out, it's pretty cool. Yeah, finally, if you want to watch some videos, we'll put some videos over there. And if, uh, yeah, that's it. Goodbye.